Hi, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians on the American Songwriter Podcast Network. I'm your host, Cindy Howes. Hi, thanks for listening. Today, I'm very happy to have the one and only Chris Smither. Influenced by Mississippi John Hurt and Lightning Hopkins, Smither's guitar playing is centered around the beat and around the groove. He mics his feet during concerts and loves being able to sound like several different instruments as his heroes did. Smither says, groove is the essence of engagement. He's lived an extraordinary life that started off moving around due to his linguistic parents' careers. He ended up in New Orleans for the bulk of his childhood with a short stint in Paris that allowed him to become fluent in French, among other languages. Something notable about Smither, as a songwriter, he has the hardest time with the lyrics, which is strange as the son of language professors. He talks about the impact of their work in his own songs. We also get some great stories from Smither, like showing up at Eric Von Schmidt's house in Florida that eventually led him to moving to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Once he arrived, he started hanging around incredible musicians. One young musician named Bonnie Raitt in particular took to his song, Love You Like a Man, and recorded it. Nearly 40 years later, it's still a staple of her live sets. We get to hear about the kind of career that Chris had envisioned for himself and why his alcoholism held him back for over a decade. Smither also talks about his relationship with his father, particularly through his song, Father's Day. He re-recorded that and eight other of his older songs for his latest album, More From The Levee. That also includes one brand new song, What I Do. Chris Smither is a treasure. This was such a cool conversation. Hope you enjoy it. We'll check out the song What I Do from Chris's new album. This is a, the new track that he recorded for the record. And then we'll get to our conversation with the great Chris Smither on Basic Folk. Fish don't understand the water, they just do the things they ought to. Birds don't understand the air, they don't even know it's there. They don't have a clue, but just like me, they do the things they do. It's what I do, it's what I do, it's what I do. Chris Smither, thanks for joining me today, and congrats on the new record. Thank you, Cindy. It's good to see you. Your family moved around a few places, but eventually like settled in New Orleans when you and your twin sister were three, um, and your parents were college professors of language. They taught at Tulane. Right. What did your house look like growing up because of that? It was full of books. <laughs> it was, uh, um, I mean, because of the fact that they were university professors. Yeah, and they, like, loved language. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of books and a lot of... Um, I, I, you know, it's hard for me to spell out what the distinction would be because that's the, the only way that I grew up was, you know, the children of academics, you know. I didn't know there was any other way to live. In fact, all my other friends were faculty brats, too, so their houses were more or less like mine. But I know I know that that friends of mine from the neighborhood used to come in and and they would they would be astounded at the books you know to me that was just the way a house was it was full of books you know what were your favorite books growing up oh I you know I oh, there's just too many <laughs> 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 even start listing to them we every other Thursday night was library night at my house we would go to the library. And I would come home with this big pile of books. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. You know, they normally somebody my age would have been limited to, I think, four books or something like that for at one checkout. And and my father went and said, oh, he's going to get through these in a lot sooner than two weeks, which was how long you could take them out for. And so you're a fast reader. Yeah, I was even. I always was, and and but I remember coming home with a big stack of books, like ten or twelve wow. of them, and I would pile them up by my bed, and I would feel so wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> I would feel rich. Uh, I just, you know, I, I was just omnivorous. You know, I read everything. 
Well, one thing I noticed, so I was telling you earlier, I watched your stream with Alice Howe and uh-huh. Freebo, and you pointed out that you had Don Quixote and Sancho Panza right. in your in your studio, and right. I'm trying to read that book right now, and it just doesn't seem like a book that normal people read. Um, <laughs> have you read that entire book? Yes, <laughs> in <Wow>. Spanish. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh. Wow. Um, it's also funny to me to hear that you, like a son of linguistics, have the hardest time with lyrics when you're writing songs and you leave the lyrics until last. Mm-hmm. Um, this, you know, this might not have ever occurred to you, but how has the impact of your parents' work like bled over into your own? Has that changed over the course of your writing career? And has their work in languages impacted the connection you feel to lyrics in a song? It definitely has a lot to do with, with the way I feel about words. You know, it's just, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm insatiably curious about etymology of, of words. And, and I, I hear one and, I, and I, I'll immediately, if I hear a word that I, <laughs> I'm not familiar with, I'll immediately start breaking it down. Okay, so the root is this. And then so it's probably something to do with such and such and such. You know, I, I, I can't help it. It's just the way, it's the way I think. Um, and it all comes from my father, uh, for the most part. You know, my dad, at the dinner table, he would sit and he would constantly send me down the hall to go get the dictionary. Well, go get the dictionary, you know, and you go get it. And it turned into a habit. I do it myself now all the time, except I usually look it up on my iPad. But <laughs> it's the same sort of thing. I, I Most people don't think about language. I, I'm not talking about what you actually say with language, but just the way it works, the way syntax works, and the idea of foreign languages and how similar or dissimilar they are from your native language. And, and uh, you know, I find myself thinking in Spanish and French at times and say, okay, so that would be like this. And then how, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. It never stops. It never stops. And it drives my family crazy because I'm always trying to lecture them on things and that they <laughs> haven't the slightest interest in. <laughs> so in reading about you, it doesn't sound like you have any formal training in music. Like you just kind of like picked it up. Mm-hmm. Like you learned on the streets right. with the guitar, but like, did you learn languages that way? Yes. Um, well, that's the way you, everybody learns their native language. And, and that's the way that um, I learned the foreign languages that I, well, French and Spanish are the two that I'm good at. And mm-hmm. and that was, uh, I w- it was intentionally done to me. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was plucked. Actually, when I was 12, um, we went to uh, Paris for a year, the whole family, a year and a half, actually, and I got dumped in a French public school, um, and I didn't speak any French at all. Jeez. And um, I remember my father's and my mother's family, both of them, they were, they were all from Kansas originally, and they, they all looked at my parents and said, you're crazy, you can't just drop those kids in the, a French school. And my father said, inside of two months, they will speak better French than I do. And he spoke pretty good French. <laughs> you know? And uh, he was right. You know, it was, wow. it's amazing. And the funny thing is that once you learn one language that way, then there's something about your brain. Your brain realizes how it's done. Yeah. You know, it consciously realizes how it's done. I mean, that is exactly the way you learned your native language, your first language. But... And so then when I was 18, I went to Mexico City and learned Spanish the same way. It was wow. very quick. Yeah, it is interesting what it does to the brain. That's cool. Yeah. Um, okay, music in the house, um, in your parents' house, Josh White, Susan Reed, Burl Ives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, your mom had a ukulele in the attic right. that you found. How, in general, did your family treat music in the house? Was it like a casual thing or were they like really serious music fans i i think it was more casual i mean there was music playing all the time you know and if i wasn't playing it my father liked to play classical music a lot but he liked to listen to folk songs too i mean they had those albums obviously you know and i I learned that the serious musician in my family was my father's brother though howard he's the one that taught me three chords on the ukulele and 
and how to play all these little songs that I'd been learning, you know, because I used to sing along with the records. And he said, you can play that song, you know. That's cool. I couldn't believe it. He showed me how to get through one verse of one song. And I said, well, how does the rest of the song go? He says, it's just the same. It just keeps repeating. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> really? I said, is this so easy? And he said, it is that easy. And and I've, all, I've never forgotten this line. I've probably repeated it a thousand times. He looked at me and he says, if you know three chords... You can play almost any song you know. And if you know four chords, you can rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. What did you like about the ukulele? Um, and how do you think it shaped your guitar playing when you first picked up the guitar? Well, when I, you know, I found the uke when I was nine, and I thought it was a guitar. Yeah. I'd never really seen a guitar up close, you know, and it looked like a guitar. It looked like pictures of a guitar. And, and again, it was my uncle who said, no, that's a uke. You know, you want to learn how to play it and he tuned it for me and everything but I realized that it was something that I could do you know because I loved singing those songs and I, I just gravitated to it I wanted to do it and then when I was 12 home, again when we were living in Europe and my father at that time was traveling all over Western Europe taking care of students who were on their junior year abroad program and uh, he brought me a guitar back from Spain and you know, I got a book and looked up some chords and started playing the guitar. Your guitar playing is centered around the beat and it's centered around groove. You mic your feet during concerts and you love to be able to like sound like several different instruments as the people that you are extremely influenced by, Mississippi John Hurt and Lightning Hopkins. And you say, groove is the essence of engagement. What first hit you about the beat, and why do you think that love has like stayed with you so long, and why do you think it resonates with people so much? You know, by the time I got into that sense, and by the time I was sophisticated enough to understand that, I was probably 18, 17, 18, I was totally in love with rock and roll. When I first heard blues, particularly Lightning Hopkins, my first thought was not this is blues my first thought was this is one man rock and roll i couldn't believe that it could be <laughs> done you know and i thought i was so excited i said jeez you know because being self-taught i never really wanted to be in a band because i didn't want people to know how ignorant i was <laughs> of basic <laughs> basic musical terms and musical concepts and and uh i thought if i can just learn to do this i can do the whole thing all by myself mm. you know and um, I didn't even realize then, at the time, how right I was, in fact, that I was listening to the roots of rock and roll, and it's exactly what I was, was hearing. And um, it's the language person in me that got into that whole concept of how do you drive home this, these rhythmic lines, and these, these lyric lines, and make them stick. You know, there's, it's just, it's all so confusing. It's not confusing, but it's just intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, the, the lyric and the music, everything, you know, when you write a song, if you can sing a song to a person and they've never heard the song before and they can l hear it once and remember one line, you've won that battle. You know, that, you're, you're home free from then on because that's the essence of it. And what is it that makes them a line memorable? Well, it's a combination of things. You know, it's maybe the line actually means something. Maybe it's the way that, the, you know, as in poetry, it's just the, the sheer music of the words themselves, the way they feel in your mouth and the way they hit your ear. Paul Simon's always been a master of that. Oh, yeah. Just for the sake of the sound of the word, you know, and... And it just drives it home. I, I you know, I, I'm all very interested in lyrics that actually say something, or say something important. But at the same time, some of the best songs in the world are simple and don't really say much at all. But they have that that euphonious is that a good word? Feel about the lyrics. I always go think get of the dictionary. Honky tonk women. <laughs> You know, like, oh, you don't live it. I don't know, why does it sound, why does it feel so good to say that yeah. and say it I, and sing it? It's just, it's, it's crazy. So it's a combination of things. And, but rhythm rhythm is is the one thing that an audience, even an ignorant audience, will not forgive mistakes in. <laughs> if you, <laughs> you can make a mistake in the lyrics, you can hit a clam of a chord, but if you mess up the time, Everybody sees it, 
and everybody feels it and it feels like getting you know wrenched out of your high you know it's, <laughs> oh yeah and it's uh it's the heart and soul of it all it's that propulsive beat you know and it's got to it has to be consistent can you talk about your tapping shoes the shoes themselves or the or the process <laughs> uh the shoes themselves <laughs> Well, I've been through a lot of them, you know. They they're usually a wreck by the time anybody sees them because they have to get worn down just right. But um, they're usually um, Italian leather soled shoes with a hard rubber heel, and it won't do if the sole and the heel are made of the same stuff because then there's no distinction between the sole sound because mm. you, you rock your foot back and forth, you know, heel toe, heel toe, and you need that boom chick, boom chick. <laughs> it's like a drummer, you know, with a, the drum and, and the hi hat. You know, you, what's your you, brand? Oh, any kind, any kind, but they have to have thin soles. You know, no no big thick soles, and they've got to be thin, and they get even thinner very quickly. I've quick. I finally learned not to wear them on the street; to only wear them on stage because they wear out too fast. Um, so you were listening to folk music and started getting into country blues. Black musicians, like we talked about, Mississippi John Hurt, Lightning Hopkins, they've really right. impacted your style. Yeah. To you, how do you see? Like, in, from your perspective, how do you see the contributions of black musicians to rock and roll, country, folk music, music that's typically seen as, like, white music? Well, it's not white music. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all black music. I, and I, that's not fair. Um, especially, you know, country owes a lot to black music, but it, it, it's very strongly white as well but blues is all black rock and roll is all black i mean and that if it weren't for black people we wouldn't have those forms um rock and roll is you know people say that it's white people playing the blues but it's really not i mean you know it was black people playing different kind of electric blues you know and it was it's impossible you know it's, it's strange i did it's just all my heroes were black men <laughs> and black women, mm -hmm. uh, people who did that. Uh, and it wasn't until I'd probably been doing it for 30 years that I no longer felt as though I was some kind of an imposter because I'd gotten to the point where I was sort of doing my own thing with it. I'd taken in all these influences and I was doing what could not be strictly called blues. You know, it was a different kind of songwriting, but it, it sure... Most people... Uh, real blues aficionados will listen to what I'm doing and they say, well, he probably listened to a lot of blues, but that's not what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to hear about these. Um, in the mid-60s, you started going to Wednesday afternoon Hootenannies at Tulane. Mm-hmm. Um, how did they change your musicality and attitude towards music? Well, that was where I learned that, um, how wonderful it was to have an audience listen to you, <laughs> actually pay attention to what you were doing and the potential for that and, and what it could do for your playing. When you get into that aspect, when you get into performance as opposed to just doing it at home for yourself, most people, myself no exception, will make a quantum leap in the quality of their performance and it, because you're doing it. I mean, you have to be there. <laughs> and and it's, uh, there's an eagerness to, uh, to make it better and get more of that whatever it is that you're getting from the audience. And that's not an easy thing to figure out either. It takes a long time. Um, mm. But... That was the beginning of it, you know, an audience that was clapping for you, applauding, you know, and, and they really were into it. And I was young, and uh, girls would come up and talk to me <laughs> without me even having to make any effort. I couldn't believe it. I thought that was absolutely magical. I can't tell you how many musicians I've talked to or male musicians I've talked to that that's been like the driving oh, factor of oh, them pursuing it's, music. It's huge. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. You know, it, it takes its place among a lot of other reasons later on, you know, but in the beginning, you know, especially as an adolescent, that's, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. 
Yeah. And you don't feel like you're being a phony either. I mean, you feel like you feel like, oh, they're interested in me for a reason that I think is is valid. You know, I don't have to pretend. There's nothing that I have to make up about myself. I don't have to exaggerate or do anything. All I got to do is what I like to do. It's just wow. <laughs> um, another famous story of yours is the journey of meeting Eric von Schmidt. Right. Where here's the backstory is that he taught Dylan. Baby, Let Me Follow You Down, that you heard on Dylan's first record. And then Dylan maybe said, Eric Von Schmidt taught me that song. And and then you and a friend, he's the one that suggested it. Let's name him. What's his name? Dick Polis. Uh, Dick just suggested that you guys go to Sarasota and find Eric, and then you end up at his house. And it sounds like crazy what was happening inside. What was that scene like? And do you remember how you felt upon like entering... Oh, it was, it was, well, Dick lived in Sarasota and, and he told me, you know, he was also interested in this kind of music. He he wasn't as far along as I was, but he said, come on, you know, let's, I forget which vacation it was, you know, from school. He says, we'll go go to my house and, and Eric lives there and we'll look him up. And, and he was so gracious. I couldn't believe it. We just looked him up in the phone book and I called him up and I told him my name and I was a big fan and I was uh, visiting from New Orleans and I would love to meet him. He said, well, come on over. We got a whole bunch of people over here and uh you got a guitar i said yeah and he said bring it you know so I, <laughs> I went over well the house was full of people that to me were extremely famous half of jim kreskin's jug band was there and von schmidt himself i had a couple of his records and uh I, you know it's just a big party going on he greeted us at the door handed us a beer and said come on in you know are you around the same age of, as all those guys at that point, or are you significantly little, younger? Not significantly younger, but younger, you know, probably yeah. five or six years. I mean, you must have felt like a child compared oh, I, to... Oh, I, I did. I was starstruck. I was just a gog. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, trying to be careful not to say anything stupid because you didn't want to... <laughs> ruin your welcome <laughs> it was right. and uh, but i it was I, I was on top of the world i was just a, a billion i felt like i'd swallowed something magical you know and i couldn't believe i was where i was and this is a really important moment in your life because you play for eric and then he suggests that you go up to new york and you go up to cambridge Right. Well, he said, you know, where are you from? And I said, New Orleans. And he said, well, nobody's going to hear you there. <laughs> and I, he was right. I mean, I don't know how he knew that, but he said, you know, that he, he was talking about the whole scene that was going on. Bias, right. Dylan, the songwriters, the, you know, people were writing songs like crazy. And it was all happening in New York and Cambridge. And uh, he said, you got to come up, man, you know, hang out. Play the club. And I, what club? You know, Club 47 was what he was talking about. And so uh, I, that's what I did. I finished uh, that year of school and never looked back. You know, I never got a degree. I just took off. And it took me about three months of driving. I, I went up the East Coast, stopped in D.C. and spent some time in New York and I didn't really care for either one of them, you know. But then when I got to Cambridge, I just felt at home because mm. I, I grew up on a university campus and that's <laughs> exactly right, right. what Cambridge is, you know, one big university campus. The first day I was there, we drove over to the Club 47 just to find out where it was and this girl that had a car... It was her car that got us all the way from New Orleans, and, and she was also a guitar player and a singer. And we went and, and looked, checked out the Club 47, and who should be playing there that night but Eric von Schmidt. <laughs> what a coincidence. Like, that's fate. And it, it is just so crazy. And I, I, I went to the door. There was this you know, kind of tall, blonde guy watching the door. And uh, he said, yeah, I can... You want, you want to come in? And I said, well, I'm a friend of Eric's, and I was looking for him. Oh, he said, he's right in the back there. He said, what's your name? And I said, I told him, Chris Smither. And he shook my hand. He said, hi, I'm Jim Rooney. Uh, Eric's right around the corner there. Can, oh, wow. Jeez. And he didn't charge me anything, you know. And I, I walked in, and, and Eric, I think Eric was a little bit shocked that I'd sort of taken him right at his word. <laughs> said, okay, yeah, I'm going, you know. But he said, oh, Chris. And he introduced me to there were a bunch of people hanging around in this tiny little dressing room, you know. 
And then he says, hey, you want to get up and play some songs? And he says, get out there. You know, I'm, I'm going to start a new set in about half an hour. But if you go on in 15 minutes, you, know, you could play like three songs. Could you do that? And I said, sure. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I said, my first night in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I'm playing at the Club 47. But it, it took me a few years to get back there. <laughs> right. That was when the club was still on Mount Auburn Street. No, is that right? no, it was right where Passim right. is now. Yeah, it had moved over from Mount Auburn Street. I think two or three years before that. A little rusty. On this that. was I, I'm talking 1966. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you lived next door for a few years to Dick Waterman, who is a music journalist and had a huge influence on the development of the blues. Was managing all these blues musicians. Right. And you guys would hang out all the time. What would it be like when you would visit his house? Well, I, it wouldn't quite be accurate to say I hung out with him all the time. I just would go to his house and hang out with whoever was hanging out in his living room. <laughs> but, I mean, it was, it was a collection of people, all of them, um, basic building blocks of the blues. You know, Sun House would be there, or Skip James, or uh, Fred McDowell. Um, he managed half of those guys, Dick did. He he would put together tours of blues musicians to Africa, <laughs> you know, take the music wow. back to where it sort of originally came from. Doing he did did State Department tours. He was totally involved in that. And I also met his redheaded girlfriend there. Um, and his redheaded girlfriend was Bonnie Raid. <laughs> was, uh, that was the craziest thing because that's how I knew her was with Dick Waterman's girlfriend. She was always hanging around listening to all these blues guys too, you know. And it wasn't for years. I mean, seriously, three year, three or four years later that I realized that she also played guitar and sang, you know, and it was crazy. What was it like for you when you first heard her and like in general, what do you like about Bonnie Raitt's playing? Oh, well, I mean, she, <laughs> she, what's not to like? You know, she picked it all up from the same people that I was totally enamored of and, and uh, was quite good at it. She, she was a big slide and still is, you know, a very good slide player. Um, that was how I first found out that she played guitar at all because she had gone to Philadelphia. She and Dick were still together and, and in Philadelphia, and I went down to Philadelphia to play a four-day stand at the main point and I got there early and I went over to Dick's apartment and Dick was out of town but Bonnie was there and we were hanging out and she said well what you been up to and I said oh I get some new tunes and she said play me I played her something and uh, she says oh that's oh that's cool she says you should play that on slide that'd make a great slide tune and I said I don't play slide and she said oh it's easy look <laughs> that was the first time I <laughs> That's the first time I'd ever seen her play the guitar. You're like, Wait, and I was, what? <laughs> really? I'm just sitting there with my jaw on the floor, you know, and she, she's singing and playing. It was crazy. Do you have any idea why it took her three years to play guitar in front of you? No, I, I don't. Uh, I, I think it was more not so much any reticence on her part. It was just an obliviousness on mine, you know. <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize that there was this, you know, Sort of treasure in the making, you know, sitting right in front of me. So you wrote the song Love You Like a Man in the 70s, and then Bonnie Raitt did it on her second record in 72 right. as Love Me Like a Man, changing the genders and changing the perspective. Right. It's been covered a bunch of times by only women. Yeah. And to you, like, aside from the genders changing, how does the perspective and how does the song change when it's sung from a male versus a female perspective? Well, when women do it, there's more of a sense of longing to it, you know. I, the the lyric sense is the same, but it's just, it's the difference between somebody saying, I can do this for you, and somebody saying, I need you to do this for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, that's really it. Uh, when I first conceived of the song, I was just beginning to kind of get my consciousness raised with re regard to women and equal rights and you know gender inequality and stuff like that so what I was trying to do really I think was and this is at the tender age of like 23 you know something like that I was trying to write 
a, a liberated song that still had that a little taste of that traditional blues male braggadocio, mm-hmm. but bra- bragging about something that would not normally be bragged about in it, you know, which is I can understand you, I can understand how you feel, and I can empathize as opposed to just dominate. And, oh, words. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> and, you know, Bonnie caught that and immediately, she, you know, she just went into another gear on it. You know, it's not that she had to change the words so much except, you know, for the basic pronouns and, and the direction that it was going. But she, you know, made this little subtle shift so that it became, as opposed to any kind of braggadocio, as a kind of strong pleading, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, uh, not a demand, but an emphatic request. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put it that way. And, you know, and it just resonated with people. I never expected it. I, I yeah. was so happy that she, that she recorded. I would have been happy if anybody recorded any of my songs, you know, yeah. and, but, you know, she wasn't even as well known as I was when she recorded that song. Yeah. And, and, but I loved it. And the song just took off and people, People play it all the time now, and and still to this day. And uh, uh, I've said many times, it's like watching one of your kids grow up. You know, uh, go to college and <laughs> make a success of themselves, and then if you're really lucky, they send a check home to dad once in a right. while. Right, <laughs> they buy you a house. <laughs> It seems like you've had two careers. I don't know if you'd agree with this, like the two records from the 70s before Mm -hmm. you got sober and then like everything after you got sober. Right. There's that 12 year gap. Yeah. How do you think your music and your career aspirations changed after you got sober? Oh, that was a um, pretty profound change. when I was making the first two records and I'd gotten a deal, you know, with a big record company, which that was the, that was the, the be all and end all of a musician's existence in those days. That was mm-hmm. the goal. And I thought I was going to be a star. I mean, I thought I was going to, you know, re- be really big. And that was what I wanted, I thought. And, uh, you know, you, you go through something like alcoholism and, and recovery from, all that kind of abuse. And you change your perspective and you realize that the first thing that you realize is you don't have to be a star. Um, you can still make a good living. <laughs> you can do mm-hmm. it. You know, you have to pay attention to things that you weren't paying any attention to before. And you have to work with good people. You have to find good people to work with. And part of it is a question of knowing how to recognize them. And it's much easier to recognize them when you're not doing it through, you know, an alcohol-fueled f- fog. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and it's also a basic realization that it's not about you. Uh, it's about the music. Mm. I think that, that I had a tendency, and I think this is very common with young musicians. I don't blame them. You get up and you feel that you are what's on display, and. You have to make the music match you or your image of yourself and that the people are responding to you. And what I discovered was that that, that's not the the proper focus. The the focus should be on the music. And if you take care of that, you will get a lot of attention, more than you want sometimes, (laughs) you know. (laughs) But it's if you just take care of the music first, the rest will follow. And you don't have to be famous. But if you take care of all that business, you'll probably be at least well known. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, to, to a certain extent. It's just where the focus is, you know. It's difficult for me sometimes to actually phrase it as clearly as I see it in my head. But I guess the, the clearest I can say is what I've already said is it's not about me, it's about the music. Yeah. Sounds like such a huge lesson yeah. to come out of that so good work processing (laughs) (laughs) well so i just feel lucky um in revisiting some of these songs for the levy collections you've expressed like surprise at how 
good some of the songs are that you wrote in your 20s mm-hmm. when you know you're not like you hardly like know anything at all yeah how do you reflect on yourself in your 20s versus like the actual reality of it and like do you think you're too hard on your younger self um maybe you know from the my present perspective realizing how little I knew at the time. It is easy to discount just how much I did know at the time, you know, because I there's so many more things that I understand now about what was going on at that time that I didn't at the time. But the thing that, that surprised me, I think, the most was that even at that young age, I didn't paint myself into any corners. I, I didn't say irrevocable things that I would regret for the rest of my life. I didn't come across sort of half-cocked and sure about things that, you know, on later sober reflection I would re- realize were sort of half-baked. Is it like the way that you remember history in your head or like the way that you remember... This happens to me in interviews where... Well, not anymore because I'm really good at them. But like, um, <laughs> you are. when I was, thank you, when I was um, younger and would do interviews, I would have all this anxiety in my head and all of these like, like in my head, it sounded really bad. And then I'd go back and listen to it and be like, oh, it was just like the, the noise yeah. that was happening. Right. You know, so it's like, did you also feel that noise inside of you when you were younger but the actuality is that you were quite reserved and quite conservative in your songwriting. Uh, yes. I was always aware that I hadn't quite gotten it the way I wanted to, either in the performance or in the writing itself. Um, the performance was actually worse than that. I, I can't tell you how many nights I would come off stage and think, oh, man, I just blew that whole set. I mean, it didn't have the feel. I was missing the groove and I was doing that. And I also can't tell you how many times someone has played me a recording of that very same set later. And I go, now what the hell was wrong with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, but I just wasn't hearing it that way, you know. And so you're your own worst critic, um, almost invariably, at least if you've got any sense of self-awareness. I mean, I know that there are people out there who think they're the best. Right. (laughs) And absolutely that everything that they do is great. And they're usually wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know, (laughs) but everybody everybody that I I know with any sense of self-awareness goes through those those periods and Roseanne Cash calls it the committee. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a good one. The complaint committee or or yeah. something. But you know, you, you just have to learn and and you do learn eventually if you stay in the business that you're not the best appraiser of your own work at times, you know. I have a couple questions about uh-huh. the song Father's Day, which is right. um on the the latest record re recorded. Right. Your dad is no longer with us, correct? Correct. Um, so I want to hear your take on the notion of how, you know, it's not manly to show affection or show empathy towards others, like especially that kind of affection or that kind of empathy between a son and a father. That's, um, a function of my generation. I think it's a lot easier now. Um, I think men younger than I am have an easier time of that. At least some of them do. Um, I started to get over that when my father was an old man. But, you know, my father never really got got used to me hugging him. <laughs> mm. You know? And uh, I got stubborn enough, you know, the older he got to not even care. If I felt him stiffen up, I'd just squeeze him harder. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I love that. And... and uh, uh, and he eventually acquiesced to it. And and writing that song, Father's Day, I remember it being extremely difficult to write. It was probably as straightforward as I'd ever been, you know, with him. And I dedicated that whole album. The, whole, the album was called Leave the Light On. And I dedicated that whole album to him. And uh, it made a huge impression on him. He called me up, you know, <laughs> and he said, it just occurred to me that I might never have told you that I was proud of you, but I am. <laughs> you know? 
How'd and that feel? It felt wonderful, but it felt more wonderful to write the song. Yeah. And ask for it, because that's part of the song is that it asks for that. Yeah. And it's, it's a realization, and and uh, it's a liberating kind of thing. It's 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 a shame, in a way that. Uh, you have to go through a whole lifetime to get to that point. And, um, you know, now I'm a father, you know, and I have a daughter. She's now 16 years old, and I try to be mindful of that, you know, and keep all those lessons in the forefront of my mind. But I know that uh, there's something that goes on, you know, with kids yeah. <laughs> and parents that then um, I know that she knows I love her, but... I'm not sure she knows that it matters yet. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. So um, full disclosure, this episode is going to come out after the presidential election. Uh-huh. So we are talking to our listeners from the past, mm-hmm. just to declare that. But in thinking about the song Father's Day and getting ready for this interview, I kept thinking about the moment in the first debate when Biden talked about his son Hunter overcoming addiction. You know, he said he had a problem, he worked on it, he got over it, and I'm proud of him. Mm -hmm. Um, You were someone who survived addiction. What was it like for you to hear a guy talk about his son getting sober like that? It it just made me (laughs) more more sure than ever that... um that he was a human being in contrast to who he was running against. Was, mm. I just, I loved it. But, you know, it's it's a measure of how far I've come that, that I sort of look at it as, well, that's the way it should be, you know. It's, it's, it's you know, that's proper. Yeah. Um, my father was much the same way. I don't think he understood uh, how deeply into alcohol I was and, and, and just how bad how badly it hurt me. Did you try to keep it from him? Oh, yeah. I was hiding yeah. it from everybody, best I could. You know, it didn't work very well, but, you know, that's that's addiction for you. Um, but basically, he was just really glad I got over it, you know. And I I, I have to say, you know, and all the the problems with with addiction is not so much what it does to you, it's, it's what it does... To everybody around you, because you don't treat them the way you should, you know you don't you know you cut them off, they are separated from you people everybody you, you hurt everyone who ever loved you, mm. whether you mean to or not, it's almost impossible to avoid, and so you come out of on the other side and um <laughs> I remember trying to tell him once that I was really sorry that I'd spent so long being like that and he didn't want to hear it you know he just you know he just that has nothing to do with the way you are now i never got a word of reproach from him or my mother just gratitude that i was better or good again well it's not okay no matter what you say but thanks a lot I'll take it for the day It'll always be that way It's what we got Can't fix it now But maybe it was never broken And if it was the fixes Would be nothing but the tokens For what we thought for years The silent fears They were never ever spoken I took all you gave or ever wanted to Ain't I done good, I needed that from you And all I got to say is by the way You done good too So you started working with David Goodrich, Goody Goodrich, yeah. in 2003, and you're still working together. 
And I was thinking about how you guys are such a good match that you can either like churn out some really great work or you could probably find yourself in a lot of trouble. And it seems like it would probably be Goody's fault if you were in that trouble, (laughs) just based on like knowing him and reading about you, like his intense curiosity pushes you to try things with your music, but it doesn't seem like he has to try that hard to convince you. Um, Can you talk about your relationship with Goody and how has knowing him made you better? Well, Goody is the kind of person that everybody needs in their, (laughs) that is at least every artist needs, which is somebody that you can trust implicitly somebody that has your best interests at heart and also understands whatever you're doing in the, in something like the same way that you understand it. You want you went on the same track. Yeah. And I have experience with people who loved my music, loved what I did, as far as I was concerned, for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> they would say, Oh, this is so good because because and I go, that's not what I meant at all. That's not it at all. You know, it's <laughs> and uh I never run into that with Goody. Um he hears it the way I meant it somehow, even if I don't get it across. He understands what I meant. And he can make suggestions, you know, that will that will help it. He says, try this, you know. And he will tell me some outlandish things to do. <laughs> you know, go scream this instead of don't say it that off like that. Go go scream it. And that whether it works or not, I know he's heard something and it's something that's that's gonna be it might not be worthwhile in the end, but it's worth trying, you know. And and I go and I do it with a will, you know. And he trusts me. I mean, he trusts me not to make him look bad. You know, he trusts me to bring him songs that are, that are going to be interesting, that are going to be workable. And uh, it wasn't easy, you know, to find him. And I've worked with some wonderful people, you know, some really wonderful people. But nobody has really gotten close to the kind of acceptance that I needed. You know? mm. I needed to feel myself. I needed to accept him, you know, in a way that instead of holding him out, you know, a little bit, yeah. I had to welcome him in. You know? yeah. You've talked about the importance of people understanding your song lyrics. This might be a stupid question, but that comes with like a lot of good pronunciation mm. on the stream. You and Freebo got into yeah. a little conversation about right. pronunciation how do you keep practiced in that, like concentrating on every word that you've sung dozens or even hundreds of times? Well, it's a question of you have to keep the material fresh, and there are several ways to keep it fresh. One thing, I don't know, this is complicated. I may step in something here. <laughs> you have to go back in a way. Well, for a long time, I would think of it as going back to where I was when I wrote the song and re-experiencing the thinking that went into it so that it was, it would become of the moment. And so just like I will sit here and try to explain something to you, and I'll be careful about the way I say it and put my sentences together because I want you to understand it. And that's the same way that, that it is in performance. But there are aspects of making people understand things that can complement the performance. It doesn't have to make it stilted. You know, it's it's more a question of making it unawkward. <laughs> mm-hmm. And if it's unawkward, then people want to get into it. They want to climb into the song, you know, and, and take the ride with you. Um, mm. Writing new songs will also freshen up the old ones. It's, it's kind of amazing in a way. Like if you got a collection of new songs, and let's say you got ten songs off a new record, and you're, you're salting them into the set, um, maybe you don't get to all of them in one night, but even five of them is enough. And and those immediately perk up the old songs. You know, they, they, you find something new in them. They just seem fresh, and it, it's it all has to do with your attitude. It has almost nothing to do with the material itself. The material itself has proved itself over the years or you wouldn't still be singing the song. It's all about how you can tune your mind up and and bring it to the task at hand. All right. Before we end this interview, 
Mm -hmm. We do this thing on this podcast called The Lightning Round. Okay. (laughs) And are you ready to participate? Oh, I'm I'm terrible at this kind of thing, but go ahead. (laughs) Okay. What was the first song you learned on the guitar? Old Blue. Had an old dog and his name was Blue. Bet you five dollars he's a good one too. <laughs> I may have learned that on the ukulele first, but I translated it to the That's guitar. a tiny guitar. It still yeah. counts. Yeah. What is your karaoke song? Proud Mary. Nice. <laughs> Dogs or cats or something else? Both. What is your coffee order? Morning with milk, afternoon and evening black. First album you bought with your own money? Kingston Trio at the Bitter End. That was the first album I ever bought. The first record I ever bought was a single, and it was the Everly Brothers' uh, Bye Bye Love. How much was it? 99 cents. That's a lot. <laughs> you better believe it. I thought you were going to say a quarter. Hmm. Uh, it was a dollar. I think singles always cost a dollar. What was your first concert? My first concert? Ooh. I think Julian Bream, a classical guitarist. Oh. What was the last book you read? Uh, It was a detective story by T. Jefferson Walker. (laughs) I can't remember the title even. (laughs) What is your dream collaboration? Mark Knopfler. That seems uh, within your reach. I hope, I would hope so. That would be cool. (laughs) It would be. Beatles or the Rolling Stones? Both, but slightly leaning to the Beatles. Flying or invisibility? Invisibility. Star Trek or Star Wars? Wars. All right, this is the last question. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? Paris. Oh, great. (laughs) Man, thanks so much, Chris. This was so rad to talk to you. Uh, Really appreciate being on the podcast. You'd be very good at this. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) No, you kept me going. That's you know, that's what all it takes, really. And, and um, you'd be amazed how many people can't do that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Basic Folk this week, produced by the great Sarah Wardrop. Lindsay Myers is our business manager. Laura McCarthy is our social media producer. Alex Stanton of Townspeople records and writes our music. Basic Folk is proud to be on the American Songwriter Podcast Network. You can get Basic Folk wherever you find podcasts as well as cindyhouse.net. I'm your host, Cindy House. Thank you so much. We're going to take a break for the holidays, but we'll come back in a big way on January 7th. Our next episode of Basic Folk, it'll be our 99th. We'll be talking to Oyan Mukherjee from Darling Side, and that will be a fun interview. Want to know how I know? Because I already did it, and it was very fun. See you then. Have a great holiday season. And that's all. Okay, bye. Bye.